A very good evening to you and welcome to tonight's Be Curious Late event where we have something to brag about. Now, as the host of this event and a representative of the University of Leeds, I'm effectively duty bound to tell you that you should prepare to have your mind blown with some truly fantastic science. But having had a sneak preview from tonight's speakers, I can personally assure you that mind-blowing research is absolutely guaranteed as the order of the evening. We do indeed have lots to brag about. First of all, some useful guidance for you. A live transcript is available for this event. Uh, the link will be provided in the chat now by our Be Curious Elves. Uh, click this to follow along with us. By way of introduction, my name is Dr. Adam Booth and I'll be your host for tonight. Uh, for my own part, I'm Associate Professor of Applied Geophysics in Leeds' School of Earth and Environment. And I also run my own set of Leeds-based research nights called Quantum Source. I'm one of those people who is only too happy to use various applications of physics in the research that I do, but ask me to develop a whole new physics concept and I'm really all at sea. This is where tonight's speakers and the collective expertise in the Bragg Centre for Materials Research comes in. This evening's event is the second in our winter series of Be Curious Lates, so if you're joining us again, it's great to see you once more. And if this is your first late, then you are very welcome indeed. In each late evening, we invite you to take a peek at what goes on inside a university with a little help from three University of Leeds researchers. Our speakers are connected by a theme, or in tonight's case, it's a person, because tonight we'll be hearing about the life and legacy of Nobel Prize winning Leeds professor, Sir William Henry Bragg. Here at Leeds, we're celebrating the opening of the new Sir William Henry Bragg building, so we'll be exploring the ongoing impact of his work through the Bragg Centre for Materials Research, which brings together scientists and engineers with the aim of discovering, creating and designing new materials. Each of our speakers has 10 minutes to give you their take on this theme. And after that, we'll be inviting questions from you. If you have a question for a speaker, just post it in the chat, which you should see to your right if you're reviewing this event in YouTube. To participate in the live chat, you will be required to sign into YouTube using a Google account. If you'd rather not log in and you're happy just to watch along, then that's fine too. Our moderator team will be keeping an eye on the chat and would love to say hello to some of you this evening. So let's give it a try now. Uh, give us a big hello and let us know where in the world you are, uh, you are tuning in from. Um, and I'll start to give a big welcome to our speakers. So contributing tonight are Dr. Stella Butler, Dr. Andy Lee and Professor Steve Evans. First up from these, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Stella Butler. Stella is Librarian Emeritus here at the University of Leeds and Honorary Research Fellow in History of Science at UCL. With particular relevance to tonight, Stella is the curator of the Stanley and Audrey Burton exhibition, Shaping the Course of Modern Science, William Henry Bragg and his legacy at the University of Leeds. So without any further delay, I'll now pass to Stella and we'll start to delve into the life and legacy of William Henry Bragg. Stella, this virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adam. And I'm delighted to be here. As you can see um, on the screen, William Henry Bragg, he was born in 1862 and uh, lived until 1942. He was PRS, that, that stands for President of the Royal Society and OM, Order of Merit. He was a very, very distinguished individual, um, a very well-known scientist in, in his day. And here he is, um, with his son, Lawrence. Who was he? Well, he came to Leeds in 1909 as Cavendish Professor of Physics. He'd spent the previous couple of, of decades uh, actually in Australia uh, at the University of Adelaide, where he built uh, and developed the teaching of physics and started investigating uh, the nature of x-rays. But it was really at Leeds that he started research um, in, in earnest, if you like. Um, he he um, was a Brit, so he was coming home. Uh, he had been born uh, in Cumbria, um, but his family, he had married out in Australia and his family um, uh, was Australian. He came back with, uh, with his son, Lawrence. Lawrence um, actually had completed a, a, a degree 
uh, in physics at the University of Australia before he came back. He was almost a, a child prodigy. And when he came back at the age of 18, went off to Cambridge and did another uh, degree. And he was very close intellectually with his father. Um, they were both uh, physicists and, and, and mathematicians. And in 1912, they started discussing um, some research that had just been published by a German physicist, Max von, von Lau. Um, and, the, and what Max von Lau had shown was that if you fire x-rays at a crystal, um, those x-rays are scattered and what you get are um, very distinctive um, patterns of spots on, uh, on, on photographic plates. And the puzzle that they uh, were working on was, was how do we relate these spots um, to the crystals? Because you get different patterns of, of spots with different crystals. And they were a kind of dream team of, of, of researchers. Um, Lawrence, William Lawrence, even though he was very young at the time, um, had only just graduated um, from Cambridge. He was uh, he'd been born in 1890, so um, he was 21, 22 when they were um, having these conversations. And Lawrence worked out that um, if you thought about the X-rays almost as as uh, similar to rays of light um, interacting with a diffraction grating, then uh, you could explain and you could work out um, the where the the planes of atoms in the crystals um, were, and I don't, I'm not going to explain. There are others I'm I'm sure who will mention this, but the very famous um, Bragg equation, n lambda is equal to two two d sine theta, was something that was a breakthrough that allowed the um, the exploration of these um, the, these crystals, and his father. Um, William Henry, our uh, our professor of physics, um, was a brilliant experimentalist and had a, a, um, a brilliant team at Leeds who actually developed um, a spectrometer, which actually is on display now in the exhibition, the actual spectrometer that, that he developed at Leeds. And that allowed them to explore a number of different, uh, different crystals, um, including um, sodium chloride, salt, and also diamond, and it and and diamond it, it, you can see on the right hand side uh, of your screen, and there um, and it, it was really diamond that uh, that that um, got the attention of the Nobel Committee and uh, and his colleagues in the scientific world, and it was for this work um, that they won the the Nobel Prize in 1915. Um, which was a, a, a huge um, accolade, uh, both for them and for Leeds, because it was at Leeds um, that this work uh, was done. So what were the consequences? Well, initially, um, it was only quite simple molecules that could be um, explored um, through this technique. But by the 1930s and 40s, uh, much more complex molecules, uh, including biological molecules, could be explored. And at Leeds, um, uh, 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 researchers actually uh, looked at, um, uh, at the sugars, carbohydrates, um, and you can see a sugar uh, molecule on the left-hand side. And of course, the biggest breakthrough came uh, in the late 1940s and 1950s with, the, uh, with Watson and Crick's work um, on the, uh, the the structure of deoxynucleic uh, acid, a deoxyribonucleic acid, um, and you can see there the very famous uh, photograph of James Watson and Francis Crick um, uh, showing off their their model uh, of DNA in Cambridge. But what about what about Leeds? Um, what was what was Bragg's legacy actually at Leeds? Well. Uh, an incredible amount of Im very important work was done uh, in Leeds, and this is, this slide just has a uh, a sample of these. Um, on the left hand side, um, you can see um, Kathleen Lonsdale. Um, she was in fact 
one of the first uh, women uh, fellows of the Royal Society in 1945. Um, by then, she, she'd actually long left Leeds, but the key work that she did in the late 1920s at Leeds was on benzene. And benzene is a relatively simple molecule, um, six carbon atoms um, in a ring. Um, she uh, showed that she used X-ray crystallography to confirm its structure and show the um, that that it, it was a, a planar, a coplanar molecule with with um, shared electrons, and that really very much opened up the 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 possibility of exploring organic compounds. And her uh, and somebody that she'd worked with with William Henry Bragg, but in London after Bragg had left Leeds, um, was William Asbury. And you can see him in the middle. And it was Asprey that moved in 1928 to Leeds. And he came to Leeds to work on wool um, and particularly keratin, a protein that is part of wool. And Asprey um, drew round him uh, very many very important um, scientists who went on to explore other biological molecules. Uh, and while he was at, at, at Leeds, while Asbury was here, um, he one of his research students, Florence Bell, actually looked at, at DNA. Um, and in 1939, um, in her uh, PhD thesis, there was a, uh, a picture of um, DNA. And Asbury and Bell thought that DNA could be thought of as a pile of pennies. And you can see that little, um, uh, little image of the pile of pennies uh, that, that, that they, they um, thought would explain um, the dots. And then much more recently, um, at Leeds, uh, Simon Phillips um, in the 1980s, Simon Phillips came to Leeds in, in 1985 and was part of the team that uh, that worked out um, the first out or, or demonstrated the first uh, image of an antigen antibody uh, complex protein complex. And even more recently, um, the other um, uh, Jonathan Haddon and Stephen Carr, who um, were part of, of um, Simon Phillips's team at Leeds um, in 2007, um, demonstrated the structure of the holiday um, junction of DNA, a very important site where genetic material is swapped between the, the two strands. So Bragg's legacy at Leeds has, has gone on for decades and decades and has been a very, very, and his, his influence um, has spanned uh, really more than, more than a century. So I hope that that has uh, has has told you a little bit about uh, why we we are very proud to have called one of our buildings the William Henry Bragg Building. Thank you. And thank you very much, Stella. Wherever you sat, please do give Stella a round of applause for a contribution to uh, to tonight's event. Um, it it re really is amazing where these legacies pop up because um, my my girlfriend Jane is a is a radiation therapist. And when I was having the chat uh, with Stella last week, just to, to say hi, um, after I'd sort of hung up on the call, um, Jane popped in and said, is that the same brag as the brag proton peak? Because that's basically how we treat cancers. And it was just this sudden appearance of his name popping up everywhere. And it's a, a really rich legacy. I noticed a nice comment from uh, Nicholas Smith in the chat there that uh, is recollecting his time as a, as a final year undergraduate in the Asprey Centre, and uh, you know, um, so you know, hopefully there's that that legacy uh, living on through you there, Nicholas. Um, I did have a couple of questions about um, about Bragg as a person, Stella, if I may, and I, I've no idea whether we actually know um, this kind of this history of Bragg, but do we have ideas about where his initial inspirations came from, and you know, what 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 got him fired up into this field as a as a child? Um, I think I I don't know about as a child. Mm. Um, he started life um, academically as as a mathematician, and he was very um, it, he was very much a numbers man. 
um, and then ha then um, needing a, a, a decent job, he went to Australia um, to the University of Adelaide and, and there um, established a department of physics. And at that time, in the 18, um, 80s, 90s and early 20th century, really the big thing in physics was atomic um, structure. Mm. And that's what he was particularly interested in. And so I think you see um, him going from the nature of X-rays and how X-rays relate to uh, what they tell us about the structure of the atom um, to um, X-rays as, a, uh, a, as an experimental um, tool for investigating um, compound structure. So I don't know whether that that helps. No, it's it's good to get some. Uh, yeah, it's good to get the insight. I mean, uh, why then did his time in in Australia come to an end, and he he found his way over to Leeds? Um, he, I think he wanted to come home. I think that okay. was that was one uh, things. I think um, Australia at that time was a very very long way away. Um, I mean, I know that the, 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 the distances haven't changed, but, you know, it took six weeks um, in, a, in a ship to, um, to travel there. And um, England and North America were very much the centre of the scientific world. So he wanted to come back to be closer to colleagues such as Ernest Rutherford in Manchester um, and others, other um, leading scientific uh, researchers. Okay, um, we did have a, a question that has just popped up in um, in the chat there, and that's from um, Kirsten Hall, who um, is just saying, um, it, can, "Can we uh, have a few more words on uh, Kathleen Lonsdale and and benzene?" <laughs> um, well, Kathleen Lonsdale um, is uh, is interesting because uh, you get well, she she um, was a very very gifted. Um, scientist, uh, very gifted ex um, in at the lab bench um, experimentally. Mm. Uh, one of the, the big problems for, um, and it's a fairly obvious thing, but um, you need crystals to be able to do crystallography. You need crystals. And, um, and actually with, with organic compounds, it's much more difficult to get um, good or, or organic to to get good crystals that you can you can um fire x-rays and get those those lovely patterns from uh so um she was a very very talented experimentalist um she was also a pioneer um uh, uh, paving a way for women um to uh to both enter education but also achieve very much in in what was then a, a male dominated world and it was a huge thing for her to become the first woman uh, frs in 1945 it was a real struggle to get the royal society to open up to women they could have done it much earlier but it wasn't until um after the uh, the the Second World War, when women had been so important uh, during um, uh, during the war in the scientific uh, uh, effort, and Kathleen Lonsdale sits alongside Dorothy Hodgkin and other um, very important uh, women scientists um, as uh, FRS and, and as pioneers. Yeah, and um, amazing solidarity to all them. You know, it's it's really amazing that they were able to do that. And um, yeah, you, you've got the uh, the big approval from Larissa in the chat there. Great to hear more about a, a pioneering woman. So uh, yeah, thanks for those remarks, um, Stella. Um, the the other material that you mentioned um, that I think was you said was the focus of um, Asprey was um, was wool. And the research into wool, does that speak to kind of Leeds's place in the, the textile industry and, and the University of Leeds, you know, the, the cloth workers presence there? Or are we talking a little bit later? Uh, no, it does. It is very much part of um, the, uh, the, the, the whole story of, of, of Leeds, really, mm. and the woolen um, industry. Um, 
Kirsten, who uh, who asked asked a uh, a question uh, just then about mm -hmm. Kathleen uh, Lonsdale, of course, has written um, the definitive book about. Uh, uh, about Asprey and about wool. So if people do want to know uh, more, then then the uh, the man in the monkey uh, monkey nut coat is is a wonderful book to to read. Excellent. Maybe we can get a link popped up to that at, at, at some point. So uh, th there's a mission for the uh, the bee curious elves in the background. Um, and you were talking then that um, so after Leeds, um, Bragg moves elsewhere. Um, and I, I just yeah. wondered if we can just say a bit about sort of his his last his last years. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, he moved. He left Leeds in in um, 1915. He did very important uh, war work for the Admiralty um, in uh, locating um, submarines and other um, important mm. um, kind of scientific work. And then after the war, he went briefly to University College London and then um, for a much longer period and, and for which he is, is very And I think we may have had a, had a screen freeze there from Stella. We'll just give a, a few seconds to see if uh, the screen will unfreeze. Otherwise, um, we may have to move on. Yes, it looks like we might have lost Stella there. If there are questions that you want to put to Stella at the end of that, then um, please do um, uh, keep putting questions in the chat, and I'm sure that we can uh, revisit them in, in due course. So um, uh, apologies that we uh, had to cut Stella um, just a little bit short there. But, um, yeah, again, uh, wherever you are, please do give Stella a round of applause for uh, for the contribution. And now, um, so we, uh, we will move on to our um, next speaker. And um, like I said, I introduced my girlfriend, Jane, earlier. Um, she is a, a radiation therapist. Um, and a bad day at the office for Jane is when she's unable to design a radiotherapy treatment plan um, that's, uh, that can't avoid a lot of collateral damage for, for a patient when they're trying to treat these tumours. So as much as they might put her out of a job, Jane welcomes any technologies that represent alternative means of administering treatment to tumours. Q research going on in the Bragg Centre for Materials Research and our next speaker, Dr. Andy Lee. Andy is the manager of the Bragg Centre. His background is in all things bio, biology, biophysics and bio nanotechnology. And underpinning his latest research, indeed underpinning each and every one of us, is DNA. So without any further DNA ado, I will pass over to Andy. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for that lovely introduction. So, yes, uh, following on from Stella, then I don't know how we follow on from Adam and Stella. Uh, however, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the work that we do with DNA. Now, DNA is a wonderful uh, material, and I use that word very specifically because here I'm going to talk about DNA in a non-genetic sense. So I just want to first say a little bit about the Bragg Centre which is what this is all about. Here you can see in the background uh, our stunning new building, which has just uh, just opened up this year. We're just obviously getting settled into it. It's a £96 million investment for the university, so it is absolutely state-of-the-art research facilities on campus, which is allowing us to do some really cutting-edge science. Now, the Bragg Centre itself hails its legacy from uh, William Henry Bragg and the pioneering work that was done at Leeds to understand materials. <clears throat> and it's now a collection of nearly 300 scientists which are co-localized uh, co across the campus and their activity is now focused in this building. Now, what we do in the Bragg Center covers a, a broad range of topics, not just um, based on uh, crystallography anymore or X-ray diffraction, but in all manner of materials. So everything from uh, Photo, uh, photovoltaic cells all the way through to DNA uh, technologies, which I'm going to talk about now. A very melting pot of interesting ideas. So I'm not really going to touch much on this now because uh, Stella did a wonderful job of introducing the legacy of Bragg uh, and the work that he did at Leeds. But in essence, all I want to say here is that we can use x-rays to understand 
the insight of the arrangements of atoms within a material. And when you know the arrangements of atoms in a material, you can understand its properties and how you can then manipulate that to either change those properties or use that material in a different way. So here on the right hand side, we can see the famous photo 51, which goes back, going back to Stella's talk, is the um, X-ray crystallograph, uh, crystallography image, sorry, that was produced by Rosalind Franklin and was used by Watson and Crick to work out the structure of DNA. And you can see the, the cross, which indicates the helical nature of the, uh, of the DNA polymer. Now, with reference to the DNA itself and that helical structure, here we can see on the left-hand side the actual um, structure worked out by Watson and Crick. And we've obviously had much, uh, much more detailed study over many years now of, of the, uh, the structure itself. Here on the right-hand side, we can actually now see individual strands of DNA uh, with, a, with a microscope, rather than having to take crystals of DNA and create the, uh, the, the images, the uh, crystallographic data that we uh, previously spoke about. So this actually opens up a whole new window into uh, DNA and actually how much the structure itself varies and the relevance of that for biology. Now, what's interesting about the structure of DNA is that it's made up, hopefully you remember from your uh, biology lessons, uh, of subunits. So it's made up of uh, A, T, Gs and Cs. Now these are the uh, basic building blocks of DNA and depending on how these are arranged, this is how the, your body encodes information. Now, what we can see here is the, what's known as the general dogma of uh, biology, where at the top we can see DNA which holds your information, and note that it is two strands. In the middle we can see transcription, where you're essentially creating a copy of some of that information using some of the, one of those strands as a template, Now, this is important. And that transcript is then used to make proteins which perform all the functions in your body. So considering the DNA template part, the reason why DNA is two strand and the reason why this template can be created is because these subunits, A, T, and G, and C, they bind together in a very specific way. A always binds with T and G always binds with C. Now this is really crucial because in terms of building other things with DNA, we can use the specificity of those interactions to make, uh, to program different structures and to create different shapes from DNA molecules simply by rewriting the ATGs and Cs uh, or changing the sequences. So in, in your body, you will only ever find, um, uh, mostly you'll, only, uh, you'll find a dual strand of DNA which is two strands wrapped around each other in this uh, classical beef form helix that we see. But as uh, noted by Stella, you can actually find holiday junctions. Now this is where um, four-stranded junctions, so this is where DNA sequences are either being replicated or recombined. Now, in order to build a DNA, then this man down here on the left, Ned Seaman, imagined a concept where you could actually fix these junctions in place by changing the sequences on each of the arms to be uh, different or non-symmetrical. In comparison, a holiday junction, the arms are symmetrical because the, uh, the two pieces of DNA are the same, and that, that means that they can branch and finally separate into two double helixes. Here, Ned had the brilliant idea to uh, change all the letters in there, to, all the sequences in there, to basically stop that from happening and fix the junction in place. And then, very simply, he was able to then start actually adding these together to create much larger complexes, as you can see here on the right. Now, the original inspiration for this uh, was actually a piece of artwork uh, by M.C. Escher, which you can see on the left, called Death. And these funny little flying fishes. Now, Ned actually was a crystallographer, which again is a relation back to Bragg. And his problem that he was facing, which was highlighted by Stella earlier, is that he was unable to crystallize many of the proteins that he wanted to actually study. Now, what he conceived of was using these branch junctions inspired by the MC Escher uh, artwork here on the right to create a regular lattice structure with which you can sit proteins inside of, essentially kind of to, to nurse them and coax them into the, the regular array that he needed to do his crystallography. Now, in doing that, 
unfortunately, he never actually achieved that end goal. Um, but he inadvertently spurned an entire field of, um, of nanotechnology. And so being the figurehead of this new uh, field of nanotechnology, which grew and grew of, uh, from the 1980s onwards, uh, then what Ned started to do was to explore more complicated geometries of DNA. So taking individual strands and rewriting the sequences so that you could create more and more complex branch junctions. So here we can see um, creating little tiles where we've got each color in, in, uh, in that image there, they're all separate um, DNA strands. And as you go up, you start to create more of these branch junctions. You can see a shape, a star on the right. Now, if you add them together below, you can see the microscopy images of how these form large, larger and larger arrays. However, this was actually quite complicated still, and it took a lot of time to work with pencil and paper to work out the sequences. And what's really important here is that each sequence has to be completely independent. So each DNA strand that you're working with has to only bind to one other place within the structure. Otherwise, the whole thing ends up as a big mushy soup and it doesn't form what you want to. And this was very labor intensive, very difficult to work with. And so the field kind of reached a bottleneck until this man, um, Paul Rothermond came along in 2006 and revolutionized the field entirely with a concept of origami. Again, borrowing from art, uh, not science, um, science inspired by art, not the other way around, then near, uh, Paul dis, uh, realized that actually what was needed was to take a template and to take a very long single strand of DNA and to fold it up multiple times to form the shape that you want. So Paul's uh, concept of DNA origami was to take a, a scaffold as, as highlighted here at the left, top left, um, and this was derived from typically a virus. And in basically then folding this shape back and forth to form whatever your, your, your mind uh, could conceive, as you can see in the bottom right hand side, you can create a smiley face, for example, here in the, in the demonstration. You can then use that sequence and Again, working on the templating uh, way that you know if there's an A, you can then add a T, and if there's a G, you can add a C. You can create these short staple strands, which bind across different regions of the DNA to clip it together. So hopefully you can kind of get a, a concept of how you can fold this long strand around. And then because there's a sequence here, which now lies next to this sequence, you can create a staple strand which bridges the two. Again, using that A and T and G and C um, sequence method. And of course, down on the bottom left here, you can actually see the, um, the microscopy, the AFM uh, image that shows that this actually works, it, it's, it's real. So absolutely a phenomenal concept came out in 2006 and completely blew uh, the field out of the water. And it made it for the first time super, uh, possible alongside um, the addition of computer programs which help you design these things uh, to essentially do this routinely and to design all sorts of different objects without having to use pencil and paper and kind of work out sequences individually all the time. And so this has sort of like led to uh, getting more and more complex uh, structures and really some of the, the top end of uh, the extreme complexity that people have demonstrated is from the lab of Hendrik Dietz. Uh, here Hendrik has uh, demonstrated here on the top left, you can see this very large structure and hopefully you can see on your screens that this is colored in blue, white, and, uh, and red sections. Now what's the highlight here is that each one of those co different colored sections is a different uh, origami object, and they are designed to, order to then um, bind to each other and to self-assemble into these larger structures. So again, on the right-hand side is actually a, um, a 3D printed reconstruction from the image in the middle, which is an electron micrograph showing the, the structure. So just for a sense of scale here, you can see that this structure um, is several hundred nanometers in, in diameter. Now, what's beautiful about the, these concepts is that they're using DNA, you can program a structure and you can, de you can, um, you can build all manner of different objects, but conceptually, it's, uh, it's very simple to do in the computer and actually practically it's quite straightforward to make the object as well because DNA has this wonderful property of self-assembly. So 
in order for you to form these structures, once you've designed them and synthesized the sequences correctly, you simply have to mix them into a tube in the right ratios, heat them up so everything's melted, and then slowly cool it down, and the objects form themselves. So in the term of the smiley face, you can end up with millions of tiny smiley faces, each 100 nanometers in size, in the bottom of your test tube. And you can do this at home, provided you have the financial uh, backing to do so. So why? This is the pr big problem in the field, and this is a bit. This is kind of where um, I'm going to very briefly touch on some of the th stuff that happens in Leeds. Um, the reason why is is something that the field has been searching for for a while. Because as a concept, Ned started it for a particular purpose, but it grew way beyond that. And then with the revolution that um, Ned um, Paul created, it became easy to design all manner of objects to apply to different. Uh, for different reasons. So it's a, it became a, a place where actually it's a, a very um, rich field which is actually searching for as many different applications as it possibly can. So here in, the, in an image here, you can see a couple of uh, concepts. One on the, on the bottom right here, you can see with the gold um, items. These are actually photonic devices. So these are um, DNA objects, which you can see kind of like the tubular structure, that's that's the um, the modeled version of the DNA uh, from the computer. And the gold objects attached to this, this, these are gold nanoparticles or gold nanorods. And what these are, are acting as optical antennas for imaging applications. On the top, um, uh, on the top, you can see uh, a barrel object with uh, um, a tiny red dot balls going through. I wish I had a pointer, on, but unfortunately I don't on the screen. Um, and what, what this is, is this is a synthetic nanopore. So again, an object made out of DNA, which can sit inside the membrane of a cell and actually perforate it to let things in and out. So these are being uh, applied as uh, antibacterial agents, which can essentially invade the wall of a bacterium and burst them like a balloon. Uh, so uh, many interesting concepts, which are not solely uh, based in, in biology. And of course, on the right hand side here, then actually there are now some companies coming to the fore who are actually developing some of these commercial technologies. So what's happening, uh, what, what kind of things um, are we doing at Leeds? Well, there's a couple of ideas that are floating around, uh, around vaccines and drug delivery mechanisms. But I'm just going to focus very briefly on, uh, on my background, which is the uh, study of biology. So using DNA in order to uh, study uh, DNA functions uh, and proteins that work on DNA. So here at the right hand side of your screen, you can see in this image here, you can see what looks to be a picture frame, which is woven out of DNA. Now that's the, that's the DNA nanostructure. And across the center here, we can hold a substrate. Uh, in, which, in this case, we're talking about a, a, a piece of DNA with a particular sequence. Um, what we're doing here is we're using this as a, a window to isolate an individual enzyme's activity on that DNA sequence. And then you can use the, mic uh, the microscope um, indicated by this, this probe at the top here to actually observe that single enzyme performing its function within this window. Now, what's really lovely about this is that actually the geometry that you create there also allows you to look at um, things about how that, uh, that activity is taking place, like what angle it interacts and how fast it moves. You can measure uh, at, at any point. So you can actually back calculate a lot of really useful information about that interaction as well. And that's something that is really novel uh, to do using DNA uh, nanostructures like this. There are other, uh, other demonstrations that people have done um, essentially to use DNA nanostructures as tweezers to measure the pulling strength of an enzyme as well, for example, these, these sorts of things. Now over on the left are some more bi uh, biological kind of med medicinal kind of concepts. One, um, these aren't actually from Leeds, but they, these kind of highlight some of the ideas that are going on, um, is drug delivery. Imagine you can create a box that you can pop a drug inside of, and this box only opens at, your, at, at the design location. Adam mentioned this very briefly uh, with, with regards to cancer, and this is the general concept. If you can sequester your chemotherapy drug inside a DNA object, such as this DNA clamshell, and then at the point at the right location, it binds to the outside of the cancer cell and only then releases chemotherapy. You then ha don't have to pump your entire body full of this chemotherapy and, and have lots of collateral damage. 
Now, this is possible because DNA and interactions of DNA molecules you uh, are, are very specific uh, to temperature, pH, and or all, 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 um, other manner of um, conditions. And so you can actually make these objects uh, designed to open up or, or fall apart or react at different locations depending on the local environment. And the final uh, one that I want to mention is vaccines, which is obviously very, very relevant these days. Um, but these are not the mRNA or, v, uh, or, or DNA uh, kind of vaccines that you may have heard of recently around COVID. These are actually DNA objects, as you can see this, uh, this kind of um, ball uh, wireframe structure here um, with parts of the virus presented on the outside. Now, these are really, really simple and easy to make because you can essentially have the consistent uh, frame structure and essentially very simply with a bit of chemistry, click on um, bits of the virus on the outside. In comparison, um, this could be very, very cheaply and very straightforward and very quickly in the lab. In comparison to the mRNA vaccines, for example, which uh, have to be carefully temperature controlled and require going into your body to then be essentially have your cells manufacture the virus from that mRNA. So they're actually creating version of the virus in your body. This doesn't do that. This is just essentially this innate um, object, which just happens to be made out of DNA and, um, and, and, and presents uh, the, the uh, parts of the virus on the outside. So much, much easier to do. So I may be going out over time a little bit, but I just want to highlight the, this practicality of actually making these things and how simple this can be. It's so simple, actually, that uh, school student children can do this. And this is something that the Bragg Centre has been working uh, to do, is to put this really advanced cutting edge science into the hands of high school students. So with a, a collaboration that we've had recently with the Institute for Research in Schools, it's still, this is a still ongoing project and graciously funded by the Royce Institute for Material Science. Then we've managed to so far this year reach 160 students across 22 schools to put uh, DNA origami into the classroom. Now we created a whole bunch of resources, including, a, a, including booklets and tutorials, access to the software so that the students can design and create their own objects in the computer and test them in the computer. And then we provide them with practical kits where they can actually synthesize a DNA object, in this case, a spiny face in the school lab. And just to kind of prove that this is, the, that that's, uh, we're not just saying this, then here are a few examples of some of the smiley faces, that famous smiley face that Paul originally created in 2006. Here are uh, three images from three separate schools. These are, 100 nanometer objects that are synthesized and purified by A-level students in the school classroom during a pandemic. And I find that absolutely remarkable. It's a cutting edge science and it's uh, yet remarkably simple. So with that, I just want to say that there's more to DNA um, than biology. And I think everyone should really uh, have a go at DNA origami if you can. It's wonderful. Indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, a round of applause from wherever you sat for uh, Andy's contribution. Um, it's not often that my jaw drops, but, um, you know, this is the kind of a really mind-blowing stuff. It's just amazing you can manipulate this stuff. I mean, there's comments popping up here from uh, Larissa McCroy saying, you know, fantastic to see science borrowing from art. Um, there was a comment from Sadie Smith that appeared just as you started to lead to the... Uh, um the uh, the applications of the technology so um yeah you know um it, really cool to see that sort of stuff um there was a, a question from uh, nicholas smith which i'll uh, come to here which is um when you look at your style of vaccines what's the advantage of those uh, compared to um adenovirus based templates for vaccines so the the advantage here really is the simplicity with which you can uh, make them. So the adenovirus ones still require uh, genetic engineering and manipulation, which is still in a way a bit of a, a, a black art. So it can have, um, it, it can be much more difficult to do. In, in terms of what we're doing here, then your vaccine, essentially the core particle of the vaccine is made out of the DNA structure and that stays the same. And all we're doing is essentially changing using a bit of click chemistry to click the enzyme or the, the part of the, the virus, the protein part onto the outside of a piece of DNA, which then just binds to the outside. So you don't actually have to go through multiple rounds of uh, cloning 
DNA sequences into uh, another set of DNA sequences and then to put that through a bacterial colony and then to pick colonies and do this sort of thing. You can, it, it's just a much more straightforward and robust process. But again, the adenovirus and the mRNA vaccines, they've been through clinical trials where what we're doing hasn't. So, you know, it, 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 these, these are very much kind of nebuluses of concepts and a long way from uh, being ejected into your arm, for example. Okay. Uh, but I think, as I alluded to, like the, the field itself has been spent many years working out the design principles and design concepts, and it's now at the point where it's really looking for those killer applications. So mm -hmm. lots have been demonstrated, but it's really about which niche is the, is the one that can go forward. So there's a lot more going on out there than the few applications that I highlighted there. And it, it, they do cover everything from um, biological applications, which are the obvious ones, and medicinal applications, clinical applications in the body, uh, to biosensing, to biophysics, and also all the way into making, uh, doing things where you're essentially templating inorganic molecules. Mm -hmm. uh, so using using them as essentially masks to shadow the sh uh, the depossession of metals or, mm. or to create nano nano wires or nano circuits out of these sorts of things. So there's a whole plethora of things that that, that can be done with this. I'm just going to uh, bring up uh, two comments from the, uh, the, um, the 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 comments coming in. One's a follow up from Nicholas there. So um, just briefly, um, Nicholas says, you know, will the Adeno vaccine, uh, adenovirus vaccine, uh, possibly more uh, immunogenic, uh, Im <laughs> that word, Im immunogenic, <laughs> so due to its inherent viral characteristics. So th that is a very interesting, uh, interesting point. I think there's actually been quite a lot of work, uh, again, with the, in the biophysics kind of arena of using DNA origami, is uh, to actually study um, the response of antibodies to the positions of the epitopes or the, the parts of a protein um, using origami as essentially a breadboard to specifically space things out, if that makes sense. Mm. So if you imagine essentially having a, a, a flat sheet of origami uh, made out of DNA and at one point you have a piece of protein tethered to it and then spaced one nanometer apart you have another piece of protein then spaced two uh, on a separate one you have two nanometers apart and then a separate one you have three in it and you can then test the responsiveness of the um, antibody to the spacing so there's actually been quite a lot of uh, interesting work in terms of the biophysics to understand how um, presentation of immunogenic markers, for example, actually is relevant to how the immune response occurs and DNA, DNA origami is enabling that kind of work to be studied. So that can then be applied into the clinical version of developing these, these structures which actually will immune, uh, elicit the right response. So it, cool, yeah. it, right, it, it is, it's kind of, you're providing like the, 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 the reactive part only and the rest of the structure is not a virus but because you can space it in the right ways or position it uh, to work in the same way then actually it can create a very effective mimic oh it's absolutely fascinating stuff and we could chat about this all night but we we do need to move on um just to quickly pop up a, a nice reflection about the the art science link up there um a nice reflection from uh, steve here about um the the uh, the reminiscence of uh, a particular type of uh, of, of lacing that uh, it reminds me of. So um, yeah, absolutely yeah, science emulating art. It, it, it is wonderful if you actually get some really beautiful AF, uh, atomic force microscopy images. You can actually really see the the beautiful weave. I didn't show it in, in any of the presentation, but you can get some beautiful weave structures. So you can really see into the porosity of how these structures are, which is very much like the kind of knitted jumper kind of look, and it, it's it's fascinating really. But you know. Oh, these are these are two nanometer pieces of DNA woven together, so it's 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 really incredible stuff. Amazing, and we brought it back to wool again through from DNA uh, to knitted yeah. jumpers. So, um, right again, please uh, wherever you're sat, give uh, Andy a virtual round of applause, and we will move on to our final speaker, that bittersweet moment of the night. Um, now, the more observant of you might have noticed that I am enjoying a beer while I present this. And of course, what makes a beer so enjoyable is the bubbles that it's full of. Uh, so whilst it's keeping my whistle wet, um, the beer is itself a crafty prop to help introduce our final speaker. Um, the beer is obviously full of bubbles and while one bubble itself doesn't pack much, 
pack much punch. A whole pintful of them can be surprisingly potent as a source of power. So how about more of them still? The person to answer this is Professor Steve Evans, Professor of Physics and Head of Leeds Molecular and Nanoscale Physics Group. Steve, the floor is yours. Let's hear about some bubbles. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here. And um, behind the scenes, I've been undergoing a slight panic and I have to apologise in advance that some of the videos that I'd hoped to show, we just won't be able to, to do because of the technology. But I hope that you've got a good imagination. And so at certain points, I'll ask you to, to think about things uh, and um, how life would be very different if it wasn't for bubbles. And in particular, as the title says, actually bubbles pack a big punch and each on their own is only very small in terms of its effect. But when you add billions of them together, the, the, the effect of that could be incredibly powerful. Now, what I want to, so, so I thought uh, in terms of telling you something about bubbles in Leeds, it, actually there's a long and history of this and and it starts with Joseph Priestley who initially um, carbonated water so he was the first person to put CO2 into water and in, indeed into beer so we retain the beer element of this and he didn't patent it in fact uh, the Swiss uh, company Schweppes patented it so he didn't make a lot of money from that but but he was employed by breweries at the time to to put CO2 into um in, into beer and then later the brags of that we've heard um a lot about already this evening and i will only touch on really here um actually when trying to picture what at the atomic arrangement of metals um and, and crystalline materials were like turn to using bubbles and so what you do is it, we all are very familiar with the idea that if you um look in the, 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 the kitchen sink and, and you have soapy water, you can create bubbles and the bubbles will survive on the surface. So what Bragg did actually, Lawrence Bragg, but um, he, he created a way of creating very uniform bubbles on the surface. And he then used this to try and understand the arrangement of atoms in, in crystalline materials and the way, the way defects lead to weakness in materials, the way defects propagate. And so there's a very nice uh, video showing Bragg talking about using these bubble rafts on surfaces to explain many phenomena that are, are currently seen in metallurgy. So I encourage you to go and find that on YouTube. Um, then we come to some rather dubious experiments that were carried out in engineering in Leeds in, in the 70s. And, and this was about trying to understand when you crack a knuckle, what, what is the noise that you hear? So, um, so they did an experiment where they took somebody, they, they placed their hand on the device and then they pulled the finger at the same time as taking an x-ray. And what they see is that you can see in this x-ray that the joint widens, uh, but at the same time, you create a tiny bubble of CO2 and it's the CO2 bubble that makes the noise as your finger cracks. So that work I don't believe is carrying on in Leeds anymore. Then there's probably the nicer side of, of, of the bubble work that was going on in Leeds, which was largely done in food science, which is about how bubbles change the, the texture and the, the feel and the psychology, indeed, of, of the food that you eat. And so bubbles in, in food is actually quite a, a, a serious and big thing. And if you like chocolate, it's a good area to start researching. But what I'm going to talk about this evening is about work that we're doing where we're using bubbles to try and tackle um, diseases. And in particular, I'll focus on cancer tonight, but it's not solely cancer. There are many areas where you could think of using micro bubbles or nano bubbles to try and actually either deliver material, deliver drugs, or deliver oxygen or disrupt um, filaments that you don't want to have formed in the body. So there are many different ways that bubbles in conjunction with sound can be used to, to um, treat uh, disease states. And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at bubbles. I'll introduce what, what I mean by a bubble. I'll introduce sound, which I'm sure we're, we're all aware of, how we make them on the scale that we need to make them, 
and then just one example of how we're using them in the treatment of cancer. So firstly, there are many different types of bubbles. There is gas in gas, such as the ones we're very familiar with. You take a sob film and you blow it and you create these beautiful bubbles with the, with the different colors due to diffraction and interference. Um, and they're gas in gas. There's the ones I've already mentioned in chocolates. So that's gas in a solid. And then there's probably my favorite, which is gas in a liquid. And in, in terms of champagne, actually um, the bouquet you smell when you, you're smelling the wine, that comes because of the bubbles bursting and they carry uh, vapors from within the wine. And so if there wasn't, if it wasn't for bubbles, you would lose a lot of the sense of smell and, and certainly uh, with, with uh, sort of sparkling wines and champagnes. Um, but then these bubbles are all on different length scales. And unfortunately, actually underneath here, there's um, an image that's, that, that won't play because of the animation, but, but essentially bubbles go from being larger than our solar system to being sm as small um, as a few nanometers. So, so they really span across all length scales. And so there's a lot of interest of people on trying to understand bubbles and their phenomena. And what we're going to do uh, is look at bubbles only of a very small size range between 100 nanometers, which is roughly the size of a virus, up to um, a few microns, which is about half the size of a red blood cell. And the reason we want bubbles of this size is so that if we inject them into the vasculature, they can go around the body and they can go everywhere that a normal bubble would, would, would oh sorry, a, a blood cell would be able to get to. And by doing that, it means they can get to the tumor sites. It means they can get to um, other areas where we might want to deliver um, uh, therapeutic agents. So the bubbles we're going to talk about are, are around one micron in size, but, but we need to make these uh, bubbles so that they get good functionality. Um, and, and I'm going to come on to how we how we design and build in um, these bubbles and it's via a process called self-assembly. But there's one more thing I need to, to do, and this is to talk about a, a generic process of how do we make a bubble. And so we're all familiar with the phases of matter, which is solid, liquids and gas. And if we uh, were at a fixed pressure so atmospheric pressure we're all living at atmospheric pressure we know if we take ice and we heat it it becomes water and if we heat it further it becomes steam or gas so we know we can go through phases of material by changing the temperature but equally we can do it by changing um, the pressure so we can sit at room temperature and change the pressure. So if we take a gas and we increase the pressure, it becomes a liquid. And if we increase the pressure further, it could become a solid. And we're going to use the reverse process. We're going to take material that's been turned from a gas into a liquid, and then we're going to release the pressure and allow it to turn back into a gas. So this allows me, there was a video here, but the video isn't playing. So I've now got a can of, of beer. I'll open that here, hopefully. And doing demos is probably never a good idea, but, but this one I think I'm in need of now because of the videos. What you can see is a very large head of bubbles being formed from, from the beer I've just poured. And the reason that is, is that inside the can is a widget. And the widget is just a, um, a plastic ball that's got a small hole in it. And they fill this with a mixture of carbon dioxide and nitrogen and some beer and put it in the can under high pressure so that that gas is actually liquefied. And when I release the pressure, the pressure in the can drops and it turns from this from being a liquid into a gas which comes out of the hole and creates all of these bubbles. So, so by reducing the pressure, we can create bubbles. And that's the, the process that we're going to use. And the there was a second video on here, which won't, also won't play, but, but essentially it was showing a propeller blade. And when and this is a propeller on a boat, and as the propeller rotates, it creates a stream of bubbles around the edge of the propeller. And I'll, I'll sort of come to that why that is important in a minute. 
Um, but the next thing we need to, so, so bubbles, we're going to make them by reducing pressure in some way. The next thing, and life would be so much sadder if it wasn't for bubbles, I think of the noise when you're listening up to a stream, uh, you know, you stood next to a babbling brook. So again, this was a video, but it, it won't play. But but you know all of that, that the different noises that you hear associated with the water flowing over those rocks and everything. But but what you don't think of is actually that's due to bubbles being formed. And all of the different sound and context of, of that different sound comes because of the different sizes of bubbles that are being formed. And so there was a beautiful experiment by an astrophysicist in the early uh, 1930s that, that using a tuning fork, he listened to the sound of when a bubble formed and compared the, the note it made to the size of bubble that was made and realized that there was a definite relationship between the bubbles and sound. And so you can understand the sound of running water, you can understand the sound of waves um, because of the bubbles. And if you look at the surf and if you look at the white in, in the water here, that's all caused because of light interacting with bubbles in the water. So without bubbles, life would be much duller, let alone without um, the beer as well. So, um, And what we need to remember is that, that sound and bubbles are intrinsically related. The, and it's rather like a bell. Um, a big bubble makes a very low sound. A small bubble will make a very high frequency sound. So the problem we've got is we want to make bubbles that are on the micron scale so we can put them into the body. And they interact with sound that's not in the visible, uh, sorry, not in, the, in our hearing range, but is rather um, in the ultrasound range. So bubbles, will interact with sound if they're on the micron scale, but interact with sound that is in the ultrasound. And so this is where it starts to become interesting from a medical purpose. But, but I've not convinced you yet that there's any power in these bubbles, right? So, so this is the propeller blade that um, I would have shown you the bubbles being produced. So as the propellers on boats, rotate, they create bubbles due to pressure differences between either side of the blade, but those bubbles burst and they create a, in a process called cavitation. And the, the formation of many millions or billions of bubbles leads to the erosion of, of this steel blade, right? So that hopefully gives you some idea of the power. And then this unfortunate video you have to try and um, imagine is actually a video of a single bubble and it's got sound waves coming from either side and as the sound waves come across the bubble the bubble oscillates and as the bubble oscillates it gets hotter and hotter until it's at the temperature of the sun so each individual bubble here as it's oscillating in the ultrasound is emitting light and this light has a very definite frequency that as a physicist we can then map back and say actually that bubble is at 5,000 degrees Kelvin. So this is this became known as star in a jar and many people in particular in California were trying to commercialize this as a way of creating energy, which it doesn't do, but it is nevertheless incredibly powerful for um, the delivery of energy. So you could think of the energy associated with these bubbles, if they can erode stainless steel, what can they do to a soft cell? And so this is where we now bring it all together, which is this idea of um, t taking ultrasound. We're all familiar with ultrasound. Now it's, it's very common diagnostic for imaging in the body. But normally we don't use a contrast agent. But if you now injected these bubbles into the vasculature, um, what you find is wherever the bubbles are, they reflect and scatter the ultrasound. So actually wherever the bubbles are in the body lights up rather like a Christmas tree and this really then al allows you to to localize uh, or to see where the bubbles are at a given point in time uh, and so this the idea of, of therapy is then to bring these bubbles that uh, uh, really glow in in in, in the body uh, with molecular targeting agents and with a therapeutic payload to take it and or allow it to get to the tumour and then use the ultrasound to burst and release that payload. 
but because the sound in the bubbles interact incredibly strongly, you don't just get the release, a soft release, but you actually also start punching holes in the cancer cells that are nearby, or if you are treating an infection, in breaking that infection, the biofilm or, or whatever your infection is apart, and, and so increasing and improving delivery. So these are quite complicated structures though that we want to make. So, so we, before we can put something into your body, we need them to be, uh, we, we, you know, we need to reduce any immu immunogenicity. We, so we need them to be stealth bubbles at the same time. Uh, we need them to be of the order of a micron in size. We need to have them coated with targeting agents to take us to the right place. Um, and so what we did in Leeds, we developed a microfluidic system that, that allows us to, to um, pass these bubbles or, or to create bubbles by passing gas and water through a microfluidic chip. And these are made in exactly the same way as our semiconductors. But, but instead of for controlling electrons, these are based, basically control the fl flow of small amounts of fluid. And unfortunately, again, there was a video showing the production of these in real time. And, and what you can see is the bubbles are all very nicely uniform in size. And so uh, 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 then can be used. So, so then the next step we had to add on to the outside, the next level of complexity is to add the drug to the outside. So we've got a gas core. We've got our, and then we, we allow the bubbles, and this is all done by a process called self-assembly. So we use lipid molecules, we use polymer molecules, we use antibodies, and we have to get them all to assemble in the right order so that the final structure is what exactly what we think, which as we can see in these pictures here, is the circular core, the black is the gas, and the green is effectively the drug around the outside of these bubbles. And in other images, I can show you the green and the red, where the red is the targeting agent around the outside. So we can make bubbles using this microfluidics. We can then start to uh, look at the injection of these and then the destruction of them with, um, with ultrasound. So I'm sorry, I apologize about the movies. Um, it, it, it's just, uh, this is unfortunate because this is actually the data that shows um, uh, what, it, what what the image sh would have shown is is um, or what the movie would have shown is an ultrasound image of a tumor, and the bubbles as they come into the tumor they highlight where the vasculature is, and you from the ultrasound you can see it bursting those bubbles uh, and releasing the drug just in the vicinity of the tumor. So the really nice thing about this is you reduce. Um, your delivery of drug, for, instead of being a systemic delivery where the drug's going everywhere, you're um, preferentially releasing it at the tumor site. So I'm, I'm conscious um, that we're running over, but, but essentially with this approach, we can essentially, what, what we see um, if we monitor the tumor as a function of time is we can stop tumors growing. Um, and indeed eliminate tumours. This is just that preclinical study at the moment. So the next phase of this would be to go into um, clinical studies. So with that, I hope I've given you a very quick introduction to the idea of bubbles and the power behind uh, of bubbles and what they can do. Uh, the work has been done by an incredibly uh, good team across engineering, um, on the ultrasound, in medicine, on the um, on the animal models and preclinical models, and then in physics on the design of the microfluidics and so forth. And I thank you for your time. And we thank you for that bubble extravaganza, Steve. Please do give um, Steve a round of applause. He's taken a well-earned drink there. Thank you very much. I mean, it's far, it, more technologies for Jane to add to her skill set if she ever fancies a slight shift in focus. Um, some really nice reflections coming up in the chat here. Um, Regarding that pint there, um, Sadie says, you know, the head on that, not sure if Steve's had bar experience before. But actually, Sadie, no. I take exception with <laughs> that because if you hadn't have produced that many bubbles, you never would have seen the bubbles. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with Steve yeah. there. <laughs> but certainly settled down and allowing you to enjoy it now. Um, there was one question from uh, Steve Smart that I would um, draw some attention to here. And it was kind of like where I was thinking as well that 
you know, can you deliver bubbles to cross into the brain? Would the pressure create problems in the in the brain? I'm thinking of like, you know, the bends or something like that. You know, you normally think of bubbles in your blood as being a really bad thing. Um, how do you steer them? How do you know where they're going? Yeah, so so great question, actually, this because one of the potential topics, one, one of the real difficulties is how to get uh, drugs across the blood brain barrier. And so there is a real interest in taking bubbles, putting them at the blood brain barrier, and instead of bursting them, as I've shown, using the ultrasound to oscillate them. And so when you do that, actually, you create shear forces. You move the liquid, and that liquid creates shear forces and has been shown to open pores in the blood-brain barrier, which when you switch the ultrasound off or move the bubbles away, that close again. So it temporarily allows you to open um, paths across the blood-brain barrier to get drugs in. So it's really being explored. In particular, there's a group in Toronto that are leading the way, but, but that's... Um, uh, it's, so it's not proven to be a problem at all. It, it's the opposite. It, it's potentially bubbles and ultrasound could really help us get drugs across the blood-brain barrier. Um, so far, the bubbles that we're choosing to use, being on the nano or micron scale, there's not been any evidence of any problems with them causing physiological um, sort of problems, which... You would get, and, and the bends is a good classic case. If people rise too quickly when they're diving, actually mm. they create bubbles, and it's those bubbles that, that lead to um, their problems. And so if the bubbles were too large, you know, a few hundred microns or so, then mm. then you would clearly actually potentially have problems. But, but um, in the scale we're working at, the bubbles dissolve away into, into, the, into the bloodstream. Mm. Um, after a while so so after about six minutes the bubbles all disappear um, yeah. yeah fascinating stuff and i will just highlight one um set of comments that came up in in kind of the private chat that the uh that we administrators here are using uh and it was just about the uh, the star in the jar so it's getting so hot how is it getting so hot what what, what is it about the resonance of it that's making it get so fast. Well, essentially it's friction so it's, it's what we all know you run your finger down some wallpaper and it burns yeah. and essentially on this case you're moving the, the atoms and molecules in the gas very quickly using the ultrasound compression and expansion yeah and, and that's generating heat you know that's absolutely amazing and, and yeah just the fact it, it's contained in there it's it's yeah astonishing yeah. stuff it's really no, good I, I mean normally you wouldn't notice it because it's you know one very tiny micron sized bubble yeah. although actually when it's oscillating it's going from between less than a micron to being 50 microns and then back down so the, the size of the oscillation is actually quite large but but yeah it, it's um food for thought in terms of the power that you could potentially get from a single bubble when it's interacting with the sound wave now yeah. absolutely yeah amazing stuff um just in the interest of time uh, i think we do have to start drawing the session to a close but steve we'll say thank you again you can enjoy the rest of that pint now that the head on it has settled down but uh, please everyone yeah. a round of applause for steve thank you and that brings us uh, to the end of uh, tonight's event. Thank you again to our brilliant speakers. Uh, please do give another virtual round of applause to Dr. Stella Butler, Dr. Andy Lee, and Professor Steve Evans. Um, what I certainly feel is that we've seen some mind-blowing technology. Uh, for anyone who's local to Leeds, if you have got the Bragg bug, then the Bragg exhibition, Shaping the Course of Modern Science, is open to view at the Stanley and Audrey Burton Gallery in Leeds Parkinson Building, and that will run until Saturday the 5th of March. This event and the exhibition are part of a wider Bragg cultural programme, which coincides with the opening of the new university building named after Professor Bragg. You can view further events taking place in the programme by clicking the link that we'll share in the chat. And if you're thirsting for some live public engagement with Pints, then do check out my own Quantum Source events and our programme over the next few months. You can find them all by finding, finding Quantum Source through Twitter and Instagram. And finally to you, our dear audience, and I would say our dear record-breaking audience with a record number of uh, attendees tonight. Thanks so much for joining us and sending your questions to our speakers. We really hope you enjoyed tonight's event. And if you did, we'd love to hear from you. Tweet to our account at UniLeadsEngage and using hashtag BeCuriousLates um, and we'll be able to pick those up. 
If you'd spare a few more minutes, then we'd really value feedback on tonight's event, so please do share it through a short evaluation form. A link will imminently appear in the chat window, and those of you who booked the session will also receive an email with a link to the evaluation from tomorrow. If you're looking for something to continue the curiosity, you could always join us for our next Be Curious Late event happening on Wednesday the 16th of March. We'll be shining a light on Leeds' world-changing research that is helping to reduce inequalities and improve people's lives. Register for your free ticket now via the link in the chat. So that really is it from us for now. Enjoy the rest of your evening and thanks again for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>